All right, Deuteronomy chapter 21. The part of the chapter I'm going to focus in on starts there in, in verse number 18. Bible reads, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him, will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gate of this place. And they shall say unto the elders of, the city, of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, this is one of the aspects of God's law that a lot of people like to mock these days. They'll bring up, because when you bring up death penalty laws, you know, the big one being sodomy when we get attacked because we believe that sodomites ought to be put to death according to God's law, that that is what God prescribed as the just, righteous judgment to happen for that, just as he did for adultery, just as he did for first-degree murder, just as he did for all these other sins, okay? This is one of them. And when people say, oh, so you think that a, re a rebellious son, a rebellious child, a stubborn child ought to be put to death? And the implication they make is that it's like a two-year-old, right? They'll say like, oh, you think some, some kid, you know, like, like, like my children's age. What two-year-old is not stubborn or defiant, right? I mean, it's called the terrible twos for a reason. They go through that. But it's ridiculous to even say that or think that God's holy law is referring to a two-year-old being stubborn. Anybody who reads it, see, it's easy just to pick up real quick and say, oh, yes, see, it's a stubborn, rebellious son, and stop right there and try to mock God's word as if, as if God's some idiot that, that has these, these laws of the death penalty that would just wipe every single child out because they're stubborn and rebellious. It's clear from the context of this passage this is not talking about a two-year-old. It's not talking about a six-year-old or a seven-year-old or a ten-year-old. This is talking about someone who has grown more than that because it calls them a glutton and a drunkard. It says, look, we've chastened him. We've been disciplining him. He's not listening to us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Now, I don't know any two-year-olds that are drunkards. I don't know any six-year-olds that are drunkards. You know, it's, that's not something that happens when you're a little child. That's something that happens as you get older. This is obviously a law that is regarding an older child. Now, that's not even what my sermon's about, but I just want to clear that up because I, we are referring to this passage today. And actually what the sermon topic is about tonight is gluttony. This is one of the mentions. Gluttony is only mentioned a few times in the Bible by name, by, by that name. But it's definitely an important topic, and I think even more so in our wealthy society that we live in. We live in a very wealthy cu culture. So being gluttonous is even easier than ever before because we live in, a, in, you know, in very prosperous times. When you're poor and you don't have hardly anything and you're trying to scrape money together just to buy a piece of bread... You don't got to worry so much about being gluttonous because that's all you got, right? But when, but when we live in the society we do today, we do have to worry about. It. And a glutton is someone who's basically just overeating and eating a lot of food and, and just really indulging in food. That's what gluttony is. So here we see an example of someone who's a stubborn, rebellious son who needs to be put to death. And the two attributes that it brings up about them being stubborn and rebellious, it says he's a glutton and a drunkard. The next, there's only a few mentions. I'm going to bring them all up. There's actually four mentions, but, but two of them are basically repeated because they're in the Gospels. You know, there's one in Matthew and one in Luke, so it's, we're not going to read both of those. In Proverbs 23, I'll just read this for you. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 while I'm reading these. Because gluttony is always tied in with another thing. In Proverbs 23, verse 19, the Bible reads, Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So in the verse before, it's defining you know, a drunkard as someone who's a wine-bibber, someone who's drinking alcoholic wine. That's a drunkard. And 
riotous eaters of flesh is the glutton. Someone who's just going out and just, you know, eating a lot of food. Okay? And it says they're going to come to poverty. That overindulgence in these things is going to, you know, devour them and they're going to come to poverty. In Matthew 11, verse 18, the Bible reads, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath the devil. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Do you notice in all these references, because that's all the references of gluttony, it's always tied in with the drunkard. Every single mention, you don't have one without the other there as far as the gluttony goes. There's drunkards are mentioned in other areas of the Bible, but every time that gluttony comes up, it's always tying it in with someone who's a drunkard. Not someone, first of all, that you want to be in company with in the Bible. Not something that we, you know, take that to heart that, um, that you know, when it comes to gluttony, that it's referring also to a drunkard, someone who's a drunk. Because it makes sense. I mean, both of them have to do with this overindulgence, with this, with this giving yourself over to these fleshly lusts of consuming, of just consuming, whether it be consuming a bunch of food or consuming a bunch of alcohol. You're just overly just putting a bunch of stuff in your body, whether it's solid or liquid. And it's not right and it's not godly. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to see here what the Apostle Paul did, a real famous passage of the Apostle Paul speaking of all the things he does for the gospel's sake, right? Becoming all things to all men is in this passage. Look at verse number 22. He says, To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. He's, he's exhibiting how important it is to get the gospel out. He's saying, you know what? Whatever I need to do, if I need to become as weak, if, if it's going to help this person understand the gospel, if I need to show, you know, come up to them at, at their level and, and that they'll listen to me because, hey, I'm just like you. I, you know, in this area, I'm weak. Um, you know, I'm, um, what, whatever the case may be. He's like, I'm going to become all things, all men. He says, as under the law, well, I'm going to go to them just like I'm under the law too, you know, and, and kind of reach people where they're at and get right on their level with them. And he's saying, I'm willing to do all of that if by all means I might save some of them. His, his, his heart is focused on bringing them the gospel. Verse 23 says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So what he's saying here is that, look, the people who run in a race, just in general, so think about some race in the Olympics, right? These guys run in a race, there's only one winner, right? I mean, the person who finishes that one, they win. But they're, they're doing that to gain just some medal, some crown, right? It's just this corruptible gold, silver, whatever. And um, they win that physical thing. Well, we're also in a race. In our Christian life, we are in a race to do good unto others, to, to, to win rewards that God will give us at the judgment seat of Christ. That is our finish line. That's where we want to be to, to be able to, to come into God's presence where he says, you know, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and he'll reward us for the race that we run on this earth. And he says, every man striveth for the mastery. You know, we need to run that we may obtain. We want to run with the, with the prize being set before us and pressing forth towards that prize and, and, and keeping that in our minds that, you know, yes, this is difficult. Yeah, sometimes as you're running a race, you know, you get cramps, you, get, you start to feel fatigued. We need to keep pushing forward because we want to finish the race and finish strong and keeping the, the, the prize in mind at all times. He says, we need to run as if we're running to, to obtain a prize. And he says, every man that striveth for the mastery, that wants to win, is temperate in all things. If you want to run the race appropriately, you need to exhibit temperance. Temperance means control. You are in control and you are tempering your thing. Whatever it is that, that, that comes about you, you are temperate in all things. You don't allow yourself to get out of, out of whack in, in any aspect of your life. You're keeping everything in balance. You're being tempered with the things you do. And when it comes to gluttony with eating, you know, that's something that we need to keep in temperance. That we need to be able to, to 
withhold ourselves from. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 26, he says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the, the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's talking about being in control over his own body. His body is subject to him. He's saying, I'm not going to let my body dictate what I'm going to do, the, the, the course of action I'm going to take. You know, if my body's just saying, well, you just need to eat more, you, need, you know, he's saying, no, I'm going to cut it off because I'm in control here. I am going to temper what's going on. If, if my body's saying, you know, oh, I want to go out and fornicate, I want to get drunk, or what, whatever it is that your flesh, that, that, that fleshly lust might be in your body, he says, I'm in charge. I'm not going to let my body, you know, it's a very hedonistic uh, uh, thought to, to just say, well, if it feels good, do it. Right? I mean, that's what the world thinks. That's why you get so many people getting high on drugs and getting drunk and everything else. Well, it just feels good. And that is a wicked philosophy. And if you want to do anything for God, if you want to run the race, and if you want to win that prize, if you want to win those crowns, you need to keep your body in subjection. You need to be the one in charge. Now, we all have various areas in our life where we have sin. Everybody does. But we need to be able to take charge and take control over whatever the, the problem area is. And in, this, and in the subject matter for tonight, we're dealing with gluttony. And gluttony is in, uh, not being temperate in the food that you eat. See, and we live in a society of, of obesity. We live in a culture where the vast majority of people now, it seems like, are overweight. And I understand there's actually more than one reason for this. One of the reasons is the quality of the food that is being eaten, that is being consumed, that we're putting in our body. You don't even necessarily have to be overeating and be gluttonous in order to get overweight these days because of all of the garbage food that's out there. There's a lot of processed food. There's a lot of food that's, that's just not natural with all kinds of different chemicals and genetically modified and, and just different things that are not healthy for you. And they may taste good, but they're not good for your body at all. It's not, those are not the things that God designed for you to consume in your mouth for the body to utilize and get nutrition from. God designed us excellently. God's creation is awesome. And when you look at how all the different organs and everything works inside of your body, you start to learn all this stuff. Like, My, man, this is good. But he didn't, he didn't um, design us to be constantly eating you know, fast foods and this processed chicken and processed meat and, and, and everything else. And you have to remember this also when it comes to keeping under our body and bringing it into subjection. Our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. We ought to keep our temple in the best condition possible to be used to the utmost by God. We have a diverse group of, of church members here. We always, we always have. And it may not be very many, but there's always been a, a very uh, big group. But there's also, and I mentioned this earlier when we went through the prayer request, there's also been a lot of health issues with almost everybody in our church. It has been something that has been plaguing our church. Now, many causes... There are many causes for the health problems, right? There's all kinds of different things. But sometimes things are out of our control. Sometimes things happen. Sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes, you know, whatever. There, there's things that happen in our life that could cause us to become unhealthy, and it's really outside of your control. But more often than not, our own health problems are a direct result of our lack of a healthy diet and proper exercise of just treating our bodies the way they need to be treated and, and, and dealing with that um, the way that God has intended for, for our bodies to have the proper food and to not be lazy and to be up and doing things around, getting, and, and getting things done. Now, imagine how much more we can do as a church if we had everybody in here at full capacity, full health. Because look, I know... I know that the people in this room love God and want to serve Him with their heart. They, they, uh, there's an honest desire, there's an honest zeal to serve the Lord. And I don't doubt that for one second. We've got great people here. And great people that aren't here right now. Because they're out sick, because they have other problems. But imagine how much we can do 
If the physical problems weren't keeping us back and weren't holding us back. And again, look, individually, you know, apply this however you want. I am not just making any blanket statements. I'm not saying everybody's responsible and you, you all brought this on yourself. There's various reasons. You all know your own situations. But we need to keep in mind just day to day that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And God wants to use us. And if we want to become all things, all men, that we might by all means save some, let's make sure that we get our bodies in, in prime condition to be used by God to the utmost. Let's, let's make sure that we are a machine that's ready to, to just be worked and to be used by God. Because we're His servants. You know, if we're working for God, He ought to be getting the best out of us. Right? And let's keep ourselves healthy enough to know. Now, how to overcome, if you have a problem with, with maybe you know, gluttony or overeating or anything like that, you need to first of all start cutting out the stuff that you know, that you know is not good for you. We all have that. Okay? We, uh, if you don't have a, a good knowledge of some of these things, you know, try to speak to me later. I, I, you know, I'll try to help you the best I can with the knowledge that I have, but there's some things everybody knows is not good, okay? Processed foods, the sugars, the fake sugars, especially, you know, the high fructose corn syrups and all this other stuff that they're putting in garbage, you know, that the, in, the, in the sodas and everything else. You know that's not good for you. You know that it's not. And we need to, and look, I'm not saying it's a sin to ever take a sip of a soda or something like that. I'm not saying that. We're talking about overindulging, and we're talking about also just being healthy, okay? Keeping your body in a, in a good, healthy state. We want to be used by God. So let's try to make ourselves do that. We need to be in control. We need to be in charge of our bodies. And if you say, you know what? This food, this thing, this junk, yeah, it tastes good. I get instant gratification when it enters into my mouth. But in the long run, it's just a big detriment for me ever doing anything for God. We ought to be able to make the decision to say, I could do without that. Do I really need to have that as part of my life? And be able to, to, to separate that and just say, done. No more. I praise God the day that I finally stopped having, you know, because I, I was someone, I was drinking sodas all the time. I mean, every day I went to work, and this was long time ago. I don't even know now, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was working in a machine shop. And um, every day, every day, just drinking soda, drinking soda, every day. And man, when that Code Red Mountain Dew came out, I was buying that by the case. And I was just, man, it tasted good. I ended up putting on so much weight. And as soon as I, as soon as I cut that, that one little thing out, because that, that was my big, you know, problem area. Not that I was perfectly healthy in any, in, you know, in, in the other aspects, but that was like, the, the big thing. Got rid of that and physically noticing a difference in my energy level as well as my weight. Just from one thing. Just cutting out one thing. One, you know, think about your own life. Cutting out one thing can be huge. It can make a big difference. You may not realize that now, but, but really take analysis. Take a look at your own life and think about the things that, are, that, are, that you know are bad. That you know, you know what, I, sh I should not be eating this stuff. I shouldn't be doing this. And cut it out and see what happens. Take the challenge, see what happens. I mean, how important is it really anyways? How important is it? I mean, you, you have to decide that for yourself. Is it, is it really worth it? Most, more often than not, you're going you're gonna to find the answer is no. We need to learn more about healthy eating and not just some fad. I mean, the fads come and go all the time. There's always these crazy things. Oh, you got to do this. You got to get rid of all, you know, whatever. Fads come and go. We need to learn more about healthy eating that lines up from the Bible. The Bible's got all the answers. It really does. I firmly believe that, that, that we could learn the most important aspects of our lives. And I think eating and how we eat is, is a pretty important aspect. We can learn that from the Bible. Now, you can check out my series I did a little while back, months ago, on healthy living, and I preached an entire sermon on diet. But basically, the, the, the synopsis of that sermon was, if God made it, then it's good. If God, you know, God made the vegetables. God made, and he, and he dictated you know, that we could eat meat. And that's what the Levites, the, the priests were eating. You know, they were eating the burnt sacrifices. They were eating these, these offerings. So someone telling you, oh, red meat's bad. Well, then why did God have his workers eating it? 
I don't buy it. I mean, the, the things that God designed, He designed the corn, He designed the, the, you know, all the vegetables that grow out of the seeds that are within them, and they, and they reproduce, and God made that, and yea, everything that God made, He looked on it and saw that it was good. Go all the way back to Genesis 1, and you'll find that concept. The things that God made are good. He made them for a purpose for us to consume, to get our energy, and to keep moving forward. Those things are good. But even good things, if you're gluttonous, can still be bad for you. You don't want to overconsume. You don't want to just overindulge and have this fleshly appetite that gets out of control where you're not tempering your body and controlling what you're bringing in. And ultimately, though, you know, it's, it's time to take that charge. It's time to learn to tell yourself no. And this will help you. See, we're talking about gluttony tonight, but this concept of being able to tell yourself no and to restrict and be temperate will help you in all areas of your life. Learning to maintain that self-discipline, that self-control to determine regardless of what it is. If it's food, alcohol, some other sin in your life, to be able to just say no. I am going to deny the gratification of my flesh and withhold that. Fasting. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 9. Fasting is going to be a way to definitely help you gain the victory over your flesh. I, I strongly encourage everybody to try to fast at least one, you know, for one day, whatever you can handle. And, you know, I know everyone has different situations right now, especially with their health and things that are going on. Fasting is not always just, just every day. Every, you know, I mean, you can't fast every day. And it's, and it's not always appropriate if, you, you know, if your body really just needs nutrition because you're fighting off some disease or something. Not always the best time to fast, right? But if you're in a, a normal situation and you're healthy, then... Um, a fast is, is actually very good for you and it will help you to strengthen your will. Because ultimately it comes down to a willpower, right? Whether it be gluttony or anything else, any of these sins, when you are being temperate and you are being in control of what you're doing, it's will. It's saying no. It's saying I'm not doing this. I'm done. This is what I've decided to do. This is what's best and I'm going to keep doing that. Look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. The Bible reads, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. And the reason why I went to the scripture is to show you that there is a time to fast. And it is something that we ought to be doing in the New Testament. This is something that ought to be done because when they came to Jesus, they're saying, you know, hey, John's got some disciples, the Pharisees have got disciples, and they're fasting. You know, why, but why aren't, you know, Peter and James and John, why don't we ever see you guys fasting? Why aren't your disciples fasting? Everyone else is fasting. What, why, what makes you different? And Jesus said, you know what? As long as the, the bridegroom's here, there's no reason to fast. Because one of the aspects of fasting is, you know, you're, you're praying and fasting, and it could be a time of, it's a time of self-affliction. And he's saying, it's not proper. And so he says, can the children of the bride chamber mourn? Right? You don't want to, you know, it wasn't, meet, it wasn't uh, necessary for them to be mourning and to afflict their own souls while, they're, while Jesus is right there with them. While they're, while they're standing next to him. He says, but he explains that, well, the days are going to come, though, when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. Right? Jesus has been taken off from this world a long time ago. It says, he says, and then shall they fast. He's saying even his disciples, when, when Jesus is gone, yeah, then they're going to be fasting again. Then they'll go back to doing that and afflicting their souls and, and do the praying and fasting and everything else. Because he's not with them directly. And he's not directly physically here with us either. So these are the times when a fast is appropriate. Psalm 35, verse 12. You don't have to turn or turn if you would to um, turn if you would to John chapter 6. Psalm 35 says, They rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. Verse 13 says, But as for me, when they were sick, 
My clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. And here we see just the, the act of fasting is humbling and will keep you in a humble state. Fasting is going to be good for um, making sure that, that you are not getting too lifted up. You're going through the, the, the hunger pains, right, that will help to keep you with a little bit more of a humble mind and a lowly attitude. And um, fasting can be difficult, if you've, especially if you've never done it before. It's, it's real interesting when you, when you go to fast. Your nose becomes very sensitive after you've been fasting for a while. I remember when I was fasting and I was riding my motorcycle home. I used to have a motorcycle and um, I would almost never wear a helmet. I would be driving home from work and like people were barbecuing. And it's like, even just driving by going 40 miles an hour, you just smell that and it's like, oh man, your mouth starts to water. Even just after one day of fasting. And, it's very, and the temptations get strong. And the, you, get, you get a stronger desire to eat. We all know what that feeling is when you feel hungry. And the longer you fast, the stronger that urge becomes. Now, again, we live in a culture where it's easy you know, sometimes I'll be up late working on sermons or whatever, and it might be midnight, and my stomach makes a little bit of a, of, a, of a noise or a feeling, and I could just say, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go up, and I'm just going to get a snack. Because God has blessed us enough to, to be able to have food available, and I don't have to worry about rationing it off, and, and, and we truly are blessed to, to be able to say, oh, okay, well, I'm just going to have some food, and I could just satisfy that desire immediately. When I have the feeling of hunger, I could satisfy it. And it's easy to get too used to that of just, well, here, here comes an urge from my flesh, gratify it. Urge from the flesh, gratify it. And that can lead you astray from being able to be in control of your own body. The fast is you experiencing the feeling but now saying, well, I'm not going to gratify that. I am going to tell my body who's in charge. I don't care how much you're grumbling at me. I don't care how I'm feeling inside. I'm going to maintain what I want to do and maintain the focus and maintain the fast. And there's many reasons to fast. This whole sermon isn't about fasting necessarily, but it's a very good part of, of a solution to a problem with gluttony, to a problem with overeating, because specifically that's dealing with food. And if you could control yourself to say, you know what, I'm going to go on a fast. I'm going to withhold all food from me just to prove that I'm in charge that I can tell my body what to do and I can dictate what is going to happen. Now, there are times that you might fail at fasting, especially if you've never done it before. You might just break down and eat. Okay? But here's, don't give up. Don't let that stop you and just say, oh, well, I can't do it. I, you know, don't throw your hands up in the air. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 16, for a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. Just because you might fail, and it's no guarantee you're going to fail. I'm just saying it's, it, you know, it might be, if you've never fasted before, it might be more difficult than you think. And especially if it's a problem for you, it might be even more difficult than it is for someone who doesn't have that specific problem. If you fail, don't let that discourage you. Just get up and try it again. Keep doing it and try to move forward until you could, until you could finally gain that victory and say, yes, I have succeeded. And it really, honestly, it really is a great feeling when you're done with the fast, when you've gone through that portion and, and you finally decide, you know, this is when it ends. I'm ready to eat again, you know, whatever, and, and be satisfied knowing that, hey, I was able to, to beat that. I was able to tell my body what to do. That is going to go a long way to, to give you the, the confidence in any sin. There are a lot of sins that have an addictive uh, uh, attribute to them. Many sins can get addictive get to the point where you feel like you need to do something. If you could control your body with the fast, because that's a pretty strong urge or a feeling, fleshly desire, lust that you have to eat. 
I mean, that's innate. That's in all of us because obviously we need food to survive. So it's part of God's design to have that desire within our flesh. But if you can do that, I mean, think about, you know, people who smoke. They say, you know, that there's that strong physical urge and that dependency and that chemical. You're like, I just got to smoke. I have to have a cigarette. You can gain the confidence to quit smoking if you could you say, well, I'm able to fast. I'm able, I'm able to withhold myself from eating food. Why can't I withhold myself from having the cigarette? Why can't I withhold myself from doing whatever? Whatever the case may be. It will definitely help you to have that right attitude and that right mindset. Now, of course, we also ought to have the right focus in our life. You know, being focused on food is not, is, is not what we ought to be focused. It's just like being focused on money, Right? I mean, it's, it's not the right attitude to have. In John 6, is that where I had you turn? Look at verse 26. Verse 26, the Bible reads, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. This was right after he did the, the miracle of feeding the 5,000, right? He fed them with the, with the loaves of bread and the fishes and, you know, all these people. It was an amazing miracle. He had so little to deal with and was able to feed thousands, feed the masses. And then they're following him and he's like, look, you're seeking me not because you saw a miracle. He's like, you're just looking to get fed again. You're just looking for the physical food. You're just thinking, I'm going to give you some more bread. He's like, you got it all wrong. Don't be seeking after that bread. He says, look for the meat that endures unto everlasting life. That's what you need to be focused on. Don't worry about this meat that, that perishes. And then jump down to verse 35. Of course, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Jesus Christ should be the satisfaction in your life that you don't need to be getting from overeating and indulging in this food. Because I know that there is a pleasure that comes with eating food. I mean, let's face it, it's good. God has given us that as a blessing. The food that we eat that tastes good. It is a blessing to eat that good food. But you can take it too far. And that, it, that overindulging is a sin. It's gluttonous, and it's not something that we ought to be um, focused on at all. We need to just eat to, yes, you can enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a meal, but don't overdo it. Look at, um, I'll turn if you would to, to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's a shorter sermon tonight. I'm going to read a few more verses from you out of the Gospels. Luke chapter 6, 21. The Bible reads, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. So he's saying, it's, you know, it's not a bad thing to be hungry. And he's talking about physically. He says, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. But he says, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. Woe unto you that laugh now, for ye shall mourn and weep. And... Um, you know, this is similar to what happened with the, the beggar Lazarus and the rich man, right? Lazarus was saved, but he went through all kinds of hardships. He was hungry. He was begging for the crumbs off the table. You know, whatever you get his hands on. And the rich man had everything. He didn't go hungry. He didn't have any problems. But the rich man ended up in hell, and Lazarus went to heaven. And, you know, he's saying, hey, you, know, you remember in your time, you had everything, and you were good. And, but now... You know, the tables have turned and Lazarus is the one being comforted. Lazarus is the one who's in a good standing now and that he's not hungry and everything else. So, um, you know, keep that in mind that um, it's not that it's definitely not all about that uh, being able to, to fill your your fleshly appetite for, for food. Matthew 5, 6 says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. That is the, the hunger and the thirst that we really need to be focused on is, is being righteous with God. Our time is short. Let's make sure that we are making ourselves as well equipped as possible to be used by God. God wants to do great things. And as I already mentioned, you know, we've got a great group of people here that are willing. They have hearts. But the willingness is not enough. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 20. The Bible reads, But in a great house... 
There are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. So primarily, we need to make sure we're prepared spiritually, right? And because it's talking about 2 Timothy 2, someone who's being used by God. He's saying if you're a vessel that's being used by God, you need to be, um, you know, he says, if a man therefore purge himself, you know, purge himself from the sins and getting himself meat for the master's use, ready to be used by God, you'll be a vessel unto honor. You'll be a vessel that's going to be used by God. God's going to say, you know what? I want to use this person to do my work because he's ready. He's prepared unto every good work. Obviously, the most important thing is the spiritual preparedness, the preparedness. That is most important. Reading the Bible, getting things right, you know, trying to get sins out of those are all the most important things. So I don't want to downplay the most important, but you know, the, the knowledge, the righteousness, the zeal, those are all important, but let's also be prepared physically. Because some of the work that we do for God is going to require some level of physical strength to do. I mean, for example, one of the things that we do is we go out and we knock on doors and preach the gospel. Wouldn't it be great to be able to go out as long as you I mean, to go out for, for extended times, all day long, be able to, just to be able to have the stamina, be able to have the strength to go out, endure the heat, Endure the cold, endure the rain, be able to go out and continue to work and work and work for God. And then how much more can he use you if you're ready to do that? Yeah. But if you're in a condition where you're not able to do that, hey, praise God if you're whatever you're able to do. That's great. Amen. But don't you want to be used to the utmost? Don't you want your potential to be as high as possible to be used by God? I know I do. And part of that is going to come with our physical preparedness, with just being able to do the things that God might have laid out for us to do. God is doing great things already within this church. It's awesome, but let's see how much more can be done. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 12. It's the last place we're going to turn to, and we're almost done. I'm wrapping it up. I want to see how much we can do. I want to see a church that is, that is back to full health. And I realize everyone's got different problems. And, and you know what? I'm compassionate for them, and I'm going to be here to try to help in any way that I can for everyone that has problems in this church. But the problems that we can deal with personally, the problems that you can do and that you can fix, let's get our mindset to be able to fix those and, and with the idea of thinking that, you know what, I want God to use me. I want to be healthy. I want to be strong. I want to be ready and prepared unto God's use. Our, the way that we eat and our diets have such an impact on our overall health. I mean, it, there, it, it impacts everything. The, the things that we just put into our body, the things that we consume can cause, you know, if we're not eating, right, can cause all kinds of other organs and other failures and, 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 and other aspects of our body to, to, to not work and not function properly. It could cause us to get sick more frequently. There's so many different ways that, that you know, what our diet is extremely important. And whether we, um, whether the problem is just overeating or just eating the wrong things. They're both equally important when it comes to just making sure we're physically prepared. Uh, Romans 12.1, this is the attitude. This is the only way we're going to make sure that we can do even more with God. Look at verse number 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Not only think about your body as the temple of the Holy Ghost, but think about as a, a living sacrifice. What kind of sacrifice is, would you feel comfortable with giving to God? Giving to an almighty God. Do you want to give God just your, your second hand, broken down, whatever? 
You're, the, you know, the, something that's not that valuable, something that's not that great? Or do you want to give him the best? Right? What, God deserves the best. If we're going to give a sacrifice unto the Lord, I think we should be finding what we you know, What's the best thing I could offer God? And that's what we, what we ought to be offering. And in here he's saying, you know, presenting your body as living sacrifice. Let's present our bodies to God in, in the best condition that we can offer them up to and say, God, here I am. Here's the body you gave me. I'm taking care of it, Lord, and I'm ready to do the work you've laid out for me to do. Because, you know, in the Apostle Paul, he talks about even in, in Romans, how you know, he labors night and day. Now, if the Apostle Paul was just some obese man and he had all these problems and health problems and conditions because he wasn't taking care of his body, there's no way he'd be able to labor night and day and work with his hands and be an example unto them to work hard, to preach the gospel, to keep a job, to do all of these other things and to work that hard and to get so many souls saved for, for the Lord. And to be able to travel around and do all the work he was doing. I mean, he was shipwrecked. You know, he was, he was traveling. He was getting beat up by robbers. He was having all of these things happen. He had to be in some level of physical shape in order to do all of those things. I mean, it's just a fact. I'm not saying he was going down to the gym every day and getting real buff, you know, and being some bodybuilder. That's not what I'm talking about. It's just talking about basic health and being able to do these things because he was offering up his body a living sacrifice. And we ought to have that same type of mindset. And think about that too. You know, it's easy to, to not um, consider in any given moment what you consume is going to have an effect on you. Which is why you need to take a step back and think, you know, when you go out to eat or whatever, and then it is time for dessert, the dessert menu comes. Any given individual night, you could say, oh, well, yeah, you know, I feel like having a little bit of dessert tonight. And you, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of dessert tonight. But you need to be able to step back and say, you know what, am I like, is it always a dessert night? I mean, just, just every single night? Am I just constantly having this, this um, sugars and, and these sweets and things just coming in and, and being a, a regular part of my diet? That's not good. You need to be able to, to observe and to monitor that type of stuff and make sure that you're, you're eating what's right for you in order to be the, the, the best living sacrifice that you can for God. And look, everyone has to do this individually. I mean, this is something that you have to decide for yourself. But um, take, this, take whatever, whatever steps are necessary. And, you know, if you, if you want to know a little bit more about diet and stuff, I've got some knowledge in this area. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physician, okay? But there's, I've done plenty of my own research into this, and um, I know many others have here. Everyone's probably got a pretty good understanding, in general anyways. It really boils down to the self-control. It boils down to the actual just where the rubber meets the road of just following through and doing it and sticking with what's right. I want to see this church do great things. I want to see a healthy church. I really do. I want people here to just be at their full potential. And I'll do what I can to help it, but we also need to be monitoring ourselves and making sure that we can get ourselves into the right shape. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the instruction that you give us in the Bible, dear Lord. Pray that you please help us to overcome our fleshly lusts, our fleshly desires, dear Lord, of, of gratifying our flesh, whether it be with food or alcohol or any of these other things, dear Lord, that, that can cause us to, to be led astray. I pray that you please help us to... Um, Keep our bodies fit to, to, to be able to control and, and have that level of control, dear Lord, to say no, to, to deny our own flesh and our own bodies, dear Lord, for the greater good and um, that we would understand that, you know, the true joy and happiness is going to come not through the, the indulging of physical lusts, but through the, um, the spiritual um, work that you have set out for us to do in, in, in gaining the joy from reaching more people that are lost and, and, and doing more for you, dear God, it, because it truly does bring a, a tremendous joy that doesn't fade away like the, uh, the brownies and the cupcakes do after just a few minutes, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.